All right, hello everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. Please type in a Y if my voice is coming through. And as soon as we have confirmation, we'll get this session started. All right, perfect. Looks like we have plenty of Ys coming through. Hey, Pete. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, Daniel, Gary, Robbie, Alexander, Steve, Greta, Voice All Moreno. A lot of names coming through here. I just want to say thank you very much for your time in advance. Um, now, if you saw my tweet a couple seconds ago, I'm planning on covering 15 markets today. So it's going to be a work in process. I'm going to work on my brevity and trying to be a little bit more succinct into each one of these setups. But I think we're at a pretty interesting turning point. Now, when I say turning point, I don't mean something that's necessarily going to last for six to nine months, but something that is certainly usable here in the near term. Um, we're getting a little bit of a dip here in stocks. If you're watching financial media today, you're probably well aware this is like the first 1% drop in like over 100 days. Something just insane. Uh, so we're going to start off with that, and then we're going to extrapolate that over into the FX sphere, where we can look at the US dollar and the state of a couple of these major pairings. Uh, Dan just hit the nail on the head. Here comes the risk disclaimer. He is right. Uh, before we get to the charts, I need to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers. I'm going to leave each up for about 15 seconds. Then we'll get right onto the chart. Feel free to fire your questions at me. This session is all about you. So whatever questions you might have, drop those in the chat box. I'll do my absolute best to answer those when we get to the Q&A portion of the webinar. So without further ado, risk disclaimer part one. And that is 15 seconds by my watch. Risk disclaimer part two, hypothetical trading disclaimer. I'm going to look at some past trades and some strategy. Past performance, not indicative of future results. And here we go. All right, so as I mentioned, U.S. stocks are hitting a little bit of a skid this morning. If we look at this on like a five-minute chart, it's going to look like the world is falling down. It's not. This is a 30-ish handle rip. Um, I think what makes it really interesting, I think one of the reasons we're seeing so much sensitivity uh, uh, to this move, is just because we haven't had a pullback in quite a while. Uh, at least a 1% pullback over a single day. Now, notice that beginning of March, we did see the S&P scale back just a little bit. Now, I'm looking at what I call a central point of support right here around 2360. I don't have a good reason as to why this is a central point of support, but when I look at the price action wicks on these hourly candles, 2360 was just the level that was screaming out to me. We get a couple of bottoms in here, but it, it did a really good job of encapsulating some resistance, some support, some support, some support. So I was watching this as we were on our way down. We did get a brief pause at 2360, a very, very brief pause, but it just continued moving. Um, so I already see from a couple of comments in the chat box, a lot of folks think that this is something that is going to continue for a while. And it might. It really might. I'm not bashful in, in, in telling anybody that wanted to listen that I'm not bullish on U.S. stocks. And the main reason is because of this. This very long-term stretched move that's had very little pullback. We had this move in August of 2015. This was China's Black Monday. And then we had this move in the beginning of 2016. And that was kind of my tell that things were sick. But that doesn't necessarily mean a, a terminal date, right? It, it's just as John Maynard Keynes said, markets can stay irrational far longer than you or I can remain solvent. And so I learned from this one in 1999 and 2000 when I started to trade, when things pull back, you need to listen. And sure, maybe it's a buy the dip, but not everything is buy the dip. We do get retracements. We do get secular bear markets. And frankly, cycles happen. It's uh, uh, Down cycles are a necessary part of the evolution of business because this is when non-competitive corporates get weeded out of the system. Well, the problem that we've had is anytime we did have a modicum of a pullback, I mean, even this one, which was a pretty major pullback in 2007, we've had governmental help 
rush to support uh, rush to support markets, which has essentially been throwing good money after bad, funneling money to non-producing corporates in order to try to juke the business cycle. So that's led to one of the most gregarious bull markets in the history of the world. Now, there, there's somewhat of a joke within the finance realms of social media of being a bear on stocks and then buy the dip. And one of the reasons that has happened is because of what we've seen over the last seven years, where every pullback was just another buying opportunity. Now, the reason I've been so trepidatious around this move is because I've seen this show before and I know how it ends. Cycles happen. We can't predict when, we can't predict how. But when we started to see this shake in August of 2015 and then again in January of 2016, the battle lines were drawn. Because what had created this massive bubble, well, I'm not going to use that word, this massive move in U.S. stock prices was extremely low interest rates and extremely friendly monetary policy continuing to push capital into those markets. Now think if you're a retiree and you're 10 years to retirement, what are you generally going to do? You're going to make your portfolio more risk averse. Because if you only have 10 years until you know you need to retire, you don't want to take a 20 or 30 percent pullback on the bulk of your portfolio because of so much volatility from a market swing. Right, So as a retiree gets nearer to retirement, we'll generally see the equity allocations in their portfolio get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Now those investors are saying, I'm willing to take a lower rate of return, a lower rate of return, a lower rate of return, a lower rate of return for safety, for less variability in my account balance. Now the problem that we had is that after the financial collapse, after the Federal Reserve jerked rates down to basically 0%, those retirees or folks that are going into retirement as we're seeing a wave of the American population go into retirement as we're seeing baby boomers get deeper and deeper beyond their working years, it enthuses those investors to take on more risk because interest rates at the time are abysmal. And so we see people taking uh, retirees, uh, uh, older investors, taking on more risk than they would have otherwise because they are literally being prodded by the Federal Reserve to do so. And so, uh, whereas a traditional retiree might want a 20% allocation into stocks in order to smooth out some of this variation, well, right here, probably want a 50 or 60% because now those bonds in the portfolio aren't yielding a whole heck of a lot. Oh, and there's a bubble there too. TLT. This is just going to be the, uh, where is it at? I'm looking for the high shares, 20 plus. There we go. So bond prices and yields move inverse. You can see this quick spike at treasury prices around the financial collapse. And then you can see this quick move lower as the Federal Reserve jerked rates down to incredibly low levels. And as the Federal Reserve stayed on QE, rates stayed low, bond prices stayed high. Now, what's really interesting is we had a couple of months of strength in bond prices, i.e. where yields were moving lower. Now, this is October, the month before Trump was elected. This was the month that Trump was elected, i.e. the Trump reflation trade. Notice we really only had one month of lower bond prices before support came in. And this, to me, is like markets saying, we don't believe this Trump bump. Because if markets did believe this Trump bump, then I'm of the opinion that some of these really smart banks would have sold out of some of these low-yielding, long-dated treasury bonds, which would have brought a movement higher here. Lower, excuse me, lower. So the yields go up, right? Because if prices are going down, yields going up. We would have broken through the support and would have had stock prices continue to fly. If this was a true reflation trade, I would have expected that to happen. It hasn't yet. Now, getting back to the S&P 500, we're not in a sell mode yet, in my opinion. I know there's a lot of folks in the room that are already looking at this. I'm not there yet. Now, we talked about this level a couple of weeks ago. This is a really interesting one. This is simply the measured move 
of the low from the tech bust up to the high from the financial uh, ahead of the financial collapse. So I'm taking this major move right in here, low in October of 2002, high of October of 2007. It's a nice five-year long bull market. And the reason that I'm keeping this one on the chart is the 618 extension tests out pretty well, resistance and support. But then right up here, the 100% extension, the measured move of that prior is right at 2383, and that appears to be where we're getting some sellers coming into the fray. Right? We had a quick day of pop. That was uh, Trump's joint address to the union. We had a subsequent test, a lower high, and since then resistance came in. Now, I was talking about that 2360 area that I was watching for support. Right now, price actions drop below that. So if we look at this just in this hourly chart, it is going to look bearish to a degree. But I want to caution you on that because it still doesn't have a bearish setup to my eyes. I'm instead looking at this as buy the dip until we at least get below this 2316 level. We get below that level, now we can start talking about a bigger picture pullback. But until that happens, I want to retain sight of the bigger picture. It's a bull market that I don't believe in, but the Fed didn't ask me. Nobody cares. Price action is always right. Now, I harbor this bearish view. What that means is I either don't take the long position. So even if I see this thing setting up at the 38.2 right here at 23.36, I don't take it. Or... I let things actually get bearish with a break below the 50, and then I can start trying to sell on short-term momentum, waiting to see if these deeper support levels get taken out. If we get 22.32 taken out, then I'll be a little more confident in a bigger picture swing down to some of these longer-term levels like 20.75 or 20, uh, too flat. But until we get some deeper break, we just can't say that yet. Now, where I do think there is something a little bit more exciting on the equity side of the, of the coin is if we could get a deeper pullback around some of the near-term fear that we have here in order to look at some of these quality names. Now, I'm not doing a stock reco here. This isn't, uh, this isn't Apple has to go up kind of thing. No. This is to highlight the fact that we are in really just an insane, uh, insane bull market here. But there's a cool little trick with Apple. I want you to try to catch a level to work with there. I'm going to go to the monthly chart. I'm going to fib up each of these major moves. Yeah, it's only a couple observations because I'm on a monthly. But the way I see it, Apple's had a couple of different waves. Uh, Dan said New World Order. It is kind of the leader of the New World Order, right? So this is the iPhone craze right in here. You see Apple stock going from a split adjusted low of 1117 up to 100 spot 72 now financial collapse or excuse me uh this was the 2012 pullback this was already post financial collapse 2012 pullback want to guess where we stopped out at right there 50 percent retracement and on to new highs and we have a second pullback right in here of this major move you want to guess where that moved down to the 50 percent fib now, I don't know where that next high is going to come in at, but let's assume that it's already been put in. If that new high has been put in already, the level that I'd be looking at for a reversal in Apple would be right down here of 11.16.15. Okay? So if I get a pullback that's deep enough to run down to that level, that'd be a buying opportunity for me until we broke below some of these deeper supports. 102 seems like a very novel area for a stop on a 116 entry. But if I'm going to play a, a, a resurgence in equity prices after a near-term pullback, I probably want to do it in quality names uh, as opposed to just buying the index. Right now for the index, what I would like to see is a slightly deeper break of some of these support levels so that I could sell some resistance at like, where is it at? There we go. Get a break below 23.16. If I could sell resistance to that level after we get a test of 22.96, I love it. Uh, that, in that case, I could go for a, like a short-term momentum move here on uh, the S&P 500. Okay, I need to hustle up here because uh, I promised you guys more brevity. 
uh, Dow Jones. Uh, so very similar story here. This is a small pullback in the bigger picture of things. I don't want to call on the dogs for a, a, a bigger picture reversal just yet, but there are some levels of interest. I've taken this dip that we had on January 19th, right before the inauguration, using that as a swing low on these equity setups. Drawing that up to the high after the uh, joint address of the union. Right here seems pretty comfortable at 24.22. I'd call it 24 and a quarter. Now, if we do get some deeper tests of this Fibonacci retracement, I don't know that I would necessarily be moving bearishly on a 618 test. Because even if we get a 618 test, that would be a high above, or excuse me, a low above that prior zone of highs. I don't want to get too excited about that. Um, for this thing to get bearish to my eyes, I'd probably want to see a break, well, first of 20, big psychological level. But this little batch of swings right in here seems like a good area to be watching. Okay, one last one. Uh, I talked about the Russell 2000 to you guys maybe a couple months back when trying to look at some of these macro implications in U.S. equity indices. I think this is a much better gauge for U.S. Uh, economic health or performance um, for a couple of different reasons. One is it's a more broad-based index. I mean, we're looking at 2,000 stocks versus 500. But there's another reason. <clears throat> like if we go back to that pullback in August, there we go. Uh, no, right here like August of 2015, that pullback. We started to see some really, really worrisome things happening with ETF execution, right? Because the way the ETFs are priced is um, it's dangerous in, in a very fast or volatile market. If you look at an ETF like IWM, it's simply going to be a combination of, or a, it's a, a combination of 2,000 stocks that are all priced based on certain ratios, right? Well, what if all 2,000 stocks in that portfolio are moving in various fashions, up, down, up, down, up, down? Well, the ETF is supposed to track that. Now, when you have big jumps or when you have, um, you know, big market moves like we had back in August of last year as we were getting these, uh, you know, limit downs in China, Pricing this ETF could be a challenge because not only is every stock within the ETF pricing on its own, but this ETF is seeing its own supply and demand that might not necessarily be in line with the pricing of the portfolio as a whole. So we started to see some of these ETFs, none of the big ones, but we started to see some ETFs shaking a little bit on, I think it was this test and then this test back in January of last year. Um, and I think that a larger portion of the market are using index or ETF funds to get that equity exposure, right? Going back to our story of a retiree that's 10 years from retirement, if you go back 20 years, that person is probably going to be invested in some low-cost mutual funds, just generally speaking. Today, that person is probably invested in ETFs, right? Now, that low-cost mutual fund is money that's being sent to a manager to manage professionally, whereas an ETF, it's just blind. It's uh, by nature, it's passive. And I think that that could expose some areas in the market. Okay, so let's get on to some FX setups. I've gone uh, 20 minutes on stocks. All right, U.S. dollar still in a pretty beleaguered state right now. We're testing some really big support levels down here. I think this is the market just calling out the Fed, really. Um, we got a rate hike. You might not know it on this chart, but the rate hike was right here. Since then, the dollar is down about 2%. And notice that it's been just breaking lower here with very little give back. I thought we were going to get a test of these prior resistance points just yesterday. It didn't happen. Just continued to drop. Um, we just resisted off of a pretty key level right here. This is the 50% fib of a very major move, the Trump bump right in there. 50% Fib comes in right at 99.85. We've just cut through that level this morning like a hot knife through butter. Now, I don't want to chase something like that. If I do want to look to sell it, then I need to let some element of resistance come back in. And we have what could be a pretty interesting zone here between 99.85 up to 100. We have three different support or potential support resistance levels within that uh, very small range. Also got a swing just a little bit above it. Um, I might be able to look into something like that for a continuation setup, but I would treat it very similar to stocks where I wouldn't want to plot for a long-term amount of exposure on the short side of the dollar unless it was married up with something that I was 
really, really excited by. I got a couple that I'm going to look at here in a little bit, but this is something I don't want to directly fade it. I don't want to chase it. Instead, I got to try to pick my spots here. One of those spots that you guys probably know that I'm watching right here in dollar yen, we're at a really key level and we're just about 20 pips off of the bottom of that zone. Uh, so right in here we have this 80 pip zone of potential support. Notice this zone is held for a while, but again, we're seeing some pretty voluminous selling coming into that zone today and I don't really have any evidence of buyers stepping in yet. So right now it's a, it's a, it's a watching game. But out of the 15 minute chart, you can see what I'm talking about. A little bit of buyer response there, didn't hold cut right back through. Now, the reason I still like this one for long dollar exposure, well, same reasons that I've been talking about for months, but uh, when we did get that pullback in the dollar in January um, and, and well, more recently, dollar hands held up pretty well. The 38.2% retracement of that Trump bump has held up price action as the higher low. Whereas if we look at the dollar isolated, notice right now we're cutting below the 50% marker of that same move. So all this is really showing us is the additional yen weakness that's been prevalent within dollar yen. So it just gives me another factor that could help out if we do see some strength come back. Now, if we fall below this zone, I'm not necessarily going to start looking for short positions because if I want to buy the yen, I think there's better places to do it. If I want to sell the dollar, I think there's better places to do it. So if this cracks below support, I'm just going to continue watching it. See if support comes in like above that 110 figure. And if it doesn't and we continue falling, then things are probably going awry and I'm probably pretty happy I have long yen somewhere else but it's probably not going to be here against, uh, against the U.S. dollar while we're still at support. But really interesting zone right there. A lot of questions about Euro dollar. I can help out. Uh, Euro dollar's in a... <laughs> Voice all said, good call on Euro dollar, not going to parity. I got an easy shorthand for that, my friend. If you see a bunch of banks all talking about the same thing at the same time, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> I know, it's bewildering, right? But basically within banks, you get a lot of groupthink because if you're a bank analyst or even a bank, think about it. If you're out there making bold calls, you're standing out from the crowd, right? Kind of like Dennis Gartman. Now, if those bold call calls aren't coming to fruition, well, yeah, you don't look that good as a person. But as a bank, you look straight up irreputable. Nobody's going to want to do business with a bank that's always wrong. So that's why I think you'll see a lot of banks coalescing their views very often. Because no bank research desk wants to stick out from the crowd to be wrong. Now, if they're right, okay, that's great, but people have short memory spans. And when they get the next one wrong, people are going to forget about that one that they were right. So I think when, when you do see a bunch of banks all talking about the same thing at the same time, I think that's pretty interesting area to look for a fade. Okay, so your dollar is still pretty messy to me. Uh, I was looking for higher low support right in here. We got close, didn't quite get it. The top side move has advanced and we're now, it looks like this uh, a test of 108 and a quarter is, is uh, imminently in the cards. The bigger question is what after that because we do have quite a few points of resistance up here and I think this is more of a product of the dollar run. Um, you know, that dollar breakdown of recent you know, give it a quick pop here to the euro because if you look at this upward move, you know, if we strip out what's happened post FOMC, it hasn't really been all that bullish, at least, you know, compared to cable, Aussie, etc. Um, so this would be something I don't necessarily want to chase, something I don't necessarily want to fade. I do like the idea of euro strength against the yen. I just got bottom wicked out of this one last night. Uh, literally bottom wicked, my stop was 120.65. What do you think the low on the day was? 120.65. You know, and if I look at it right here, I think it said 126.56, but I got executed out at one, uh, 126.5 flat. Um, if I'm looking to press long euro exposure, I think this might be one of the areas that I'd want to do it. Uh, same reasons apply as when I'd initially set this thing up, uh, but I don't think the timing is right just yet. It looks as though we have somewhat of a bull flag forming in here. Notice we have that recent bullish move downward sloping trend channel. We're right now testing this 
little trend line right in here that have done a good job of holding resistance and giving a dash of support. Um, but I do think we're going get, to get a deeper test down towards 120 here, just off the trajectory of that channel. Now, if we get 120, or if I could get a test within this little 25 pip zone, I love the idea of looking for some longer term bullish exposure. Um, in essence, to trade off of the deviation of what I expect this relationship to develop into, which is Euro strength as the ECB backs away from QE, yen weakness as the Bank of Japan is one of the last remaining major central banks with the, the, the pedal to the floor. I can still get behind the idea of some Euro upside against the yen, whereas against the dollar it's a little more challenging considering the Fed is expecting to be in a long-term pattern of policy normalization. Yeah, Pete said uh, a lot of currency charts showed Euro yen low at 120.66. Ah, man, it would have been so sweet if it came one pip from stop me out and then reversed. But, uh, you know, th th there's a good learning point here because I get a lot of folks that, you know, that express like frustration to me around taking a stop or, you know, around getting bottom ticked. I mean, at this point, whenever something like that happens, I just laugh, you know, because it's like sometimes you just get bad luck and, and sometimes you got to. You know, you got to kind of see the humor in the situation. Um, you know, for every one stop that I get bottom whipped on, there's, you know, a handful where uh, I escape by the skin of my teeth. Um, like, I think dollar yen, I think it was back in, like, August, I'd done this as an analyst pick. I came, like, 0.5 pips from eating a stop. And then uh, that was 0.5 pips from eating a stop, like, all the way down here. And then I was up 500 pips not too long after. Um, getting back to Euro Yen. So right now, right, it, it feels as though we have some bearish momentum. I don't want to stand on the tracks when the train's coming through. If I could get support within the zone, love the idea of looking for some longer term bullish setups. Other than that, I'm going to need to see this channel broken. I'm going to need to see a higher high above this 121.95 area before I could get back on board with some bullish continuation in uh, Euro Yen. Cable's put in a pretty interesting move today, and uh, this was something that I've been waiting for for a while. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm rejoicing in the UK seeing higher than expected inflation. It's a pretty benign thing to rejoice about, but in many cases, markets are just, it's just about patience, and I think most human beings struggle with patience and discipline too, which is required for patience. But when we saw this dramatic drop in the British pound around Brexit, and then the subsequent drop from the BOE's uber dovish actions and policy outlay, the prospect of higher inflation was just mathematical, right? Because the UK imports a lot of products, they have to. And if you're a producer in America or Europe and you're selling products in the UK, and the British pound's just fallen by like 20%, well, now you're going to take a 20% hit to your revenues of products sold in the UK. Now, in an economic textbook, that might not sound all that bad, but when you're a real company reporting to shareholders, shareholders that are trying to get into retirement, and they don't want the stock price to just crater because of horrible company decisions, when when you have that outlay, you can't afford to work on theory. So what's going to happen when we see a dramatic drop in the value of a currency is we are going to see import prices going up to, in response to that. And that's precisely what happened here. British pound drops dramatically. Now if it's just a 1% or 2% drop or a 5% drop over a few months, okay, we could weather that storm. No reason to, to, to jerk prices higher. But when you get a 20 or 30% drop in a few months, that's a game-changing type of deal for your sales in the UK. So what's going to happen is we're going to see prices go up. That's precisely what happened with the Apple MacBook. Okay, For a long time, Apple had their MacBooks for sale in the UK, and we get these very traditional gyrations, and Apple would just take it. They kept their price on, on MacBooks relatively, relatively stable because right? they want to sell MacBooks. Now, once this starts to break down, 
and we get a 20% move in a currency in a couple of months. Now all of a sudden Apple is bringing back 20% less revenue from every MacBook they sell in the UK. Apple's not stupid. They're not going to keep selling MacBooks in the UK if they're losing money at it. They have two options to stop the bleeding. Either one, stop selling MacBooks. Not a good option if you're in business. Two, raise your prices. And that's exactly what we saw happen at the last MacBook refresh. It was a big jump in the price of a MacBook in the UK. And it was essentially an effort from Apple to offset this dramatic repricing in the value of the British pound. Now the bigger question is this repricing result into Brexit or the Bank of England's response to Brexit? We don't really know that answer yet because Article 50 is not going to get triggered until March 29th. My opinion is this is more resulting of the dovish action from BOE in response to Brexit because that is what tilted this thing lower again, right down here. And then again right here, September going into October. And it's, it's functioned like a wet blanket on bullish moves in the British pound over the past few months because each time we'd get up, the BOE would rain on the parade. They have a high tolerance for an inflation overshoot. Brexit is worrisome. There's no reason to look at higher interest rates right now. Well, I think one of the things we're seeing here is inflation starting to tick up and folks getting more on board with the idea that the BOE is inevitably going to need to respond. Now this morning we got another inflation print out of the UK, gave another top side move here. You can see off this longer term setup, we're still in the range. Nothing to write home about. If we can traverse above 25.55, to my eyes that opens the door for 26.85. But after that, it could get a little bit dicier. I want to see the way the price action trades within this move between 26.85 and 27 and three quarters. Break above 28.50, I can get back on board with the prospect of some bullish entries here. I have the same obfuscation with this setup that I have with the euro dollar setup to the long side. I don't want to stay or plan to stay short US dollars for too long. So another way to get that bullish sterling exposure could be against that same yen. Now this one is a little bit less developed. You can see we're kind of caught in the middle of a bunch of junk right now. Um, but I do have a couple of levels that I like quite a bit here that I'm going to use to base that next uh, approach off of pound yen. Trump bump right in here. We have the retracement of the Trump bump, which gave a perfect 50% Fibo retrace. 136.63. Beautiful kiss off that line before it popped back up. Now I go down to the four-hour chart. This is where things are going to get a little dice here. Let me get rid of that one for you. I'm going to get a little bit dice here. So if we just focus in right in here, these are the two levels that I'm looking at to substantiate approach. On the underside of price action, a break of 138.41 opens the door to 137.50 and then 136.63. Conversely, a top side break, and this is the side that I'm biasing right now because of the direction I want to get exposure in, a break of 140.62 opens the door for 141.60 and then 142.45. Those are the two areas that I'm looking at there. Now, the way that I'd want to see this top side break materialize, I'd want to see 140.62 give way, and I'd want to look for some intraday resistance here at about 141.03. If I could get that on like the hourly chart, simply move back and then try to catch it back within the zone right around 140.61. The key is I'm not looking to do anything bullish until we get back above 140. I'm not looking to do anything bearish until we break below all of these messy swings is populated on the underside of pri uh, pound yen price action. For, for continuation approaches uh, against the sterling or the yen, this is one of the more attractive setups that I have on the radar at the moment. Aussie dollar. Okay, so uh, I had a break even stop eaten on the remainder of this one. I had one target that cleared, didn't quite get to that second target at 74.50, but notice that we are still rubbing right on that trend line of resistance that we were looking at for the past couple of months. See right there, rubbing right on that trend line. Uh, also at the prior high, right around 77 and a half, uh, was a big psychological level. Um, now at this stage, I don't have enough ammunition to be able to call a fade off this set. 
You know, kind of like I was looking at the U.S. dollar a moment ago, where yes, it's bearish with the longer term setup being bullish, meaning I would like to buy it if I could, if I could find some element of support. To apply that here, I would basically be looking for resistance to hold with prices moving down to give me some kind of evidence that dollar strength might be coming back. I just don't have that here yet. Go down to the four-hour chart, and you can see where any time we got a dip, bulls responded, pushed it right back up to those highs. So if I'm putting a bias on this right now, I'm looking upside. Um, you know, at least a little bit deeper within this longer-term resistance zone. The longer-term view, I'm looking for this range to fill in. So don't have something that I want to hit just yet on Aussie. I need this to develop a little bit more. I need price action to breathe before I get that next trade. But I do think it could be not too far away here in the Aussie. This one I do like quite a bit better, Aussie Yen. Uh, I set up an analyst pick on this one last night, and this is the same logic of uh, what we were talking about for about a, uh, probably about three weeks now. Um, give me a quick second. I'll get you the, the full setup. All right, here we go. And so I you know, highlighted kind of what it was that I was looking for here, a big 8770 zone that we've been talking about. Longer term, we have a, just a legit level of resistance here on Aussie N. Okay, so the 61.8% retracement of this major move, the financial collapse, comes in right here, right around 87.70. Also, a big level has got a lot of resistance points and support points, very recent past. And then the 50 fib of this most recent major move, taking the 2014 high down to the 2016 low, confluent with that level, 87.70. Now, more interesting than that, is if we come down to this four-hour chart, you can see how bad they wanted to break through 87.70. And they tried so many times, each of which failed. Well, I guess they were successful, albeit temporarily right in here, but it came right back down. So we have kind of this wide swath of resistance here between like 87.50 up to 87.70. And I like the idea of looking for a stop above that swing and looking for this to turn over a little bit, uh, you know, running down as deep as about 84, and maybe even getting 8250 as a longer term move. But a little earlier, I mentioned if I wanted to get long yen exposure, had other areas that I thought were going to be more attractive to do it. This is that area, um, you know, essentially taking what I had noticed on that Aussie dollar chart, applying that here against the yen. Um, you know, we have this very similar setup where it's around 77.50 seems to be that zone of resistance on Aussie dollar. Aussie yen is right around 87.50 to 87.70. This could be something I could be on board for um, as far as looking for a turn. Now, we have gotten some good movement off that short so far today. We are at a trend line. So be careful if looking to open a short at current levels because we've already put in a decent little movement. It's not quite as attractive at the lows. See, there's that trend line test. I'm not going to call that a break until we have a confirmed close, but if I'm looking for long, long yen exposure, this is how I want to do it right now. Okay, making up some time here. My brevity is coming along. <laughs> um, dollar Swiss. So if I'm looking for setups where I don't necessarily mind keeping some short dollar exposure over you know, more than a couple of days. Uh, this is probably one of the few areas I'm willing to do it. Uh, I had written about this level, the zone for resistance check in Swissy in my tech article last week. Notice how clean this came in uh, just last night. Beautiful kiss in that resistance zone and then right back down. But the same logic still applies here um, where we essentially have a little bit of further development in um, in a bearish move, right? Lower low, lower high. It looks like it's trying to make that lower low right now. This is a really huge zone. 99.51 is a big level here in the lifetime of the Swissy. Uh, lifetime, it's a little grandiose. Recent price action, 2010 top, down to the 2011 low.
this is the part that's most interesting about that level to me. There we go. Okay, so there's that move again. Notice right here the 618 of that move at 99.50. Watch this. Just, just kisses off that level of resistance. Worked beautifully for like most of the summer. Now we caught a couple days of support here and then we've dropped right back through. So I think this is a little bit too far, a little bit too fast. But if looking for areas where I can hold some short USD exposure, this is one that I might not necessarily mind all too much over the long term. Now, the way that I'd want to hit this now that we've had that resistance check off of this parity level, notice the way the support was broken, okay? This type of stuff is very subjective, very qualitative in nature, but it's very, very important because you got to think about what's going on with price action at the time. Look at all that support at 99.51. That's, that, that's, that's not random, right? Swissy test, buyers come up. Test, buyers come up. Test, buyers come up. Test, buyers come up. That is not random. Now, what worries me here is that when these buyers did finally relent, when we were finally able to break through the lows, Sellers were like, oh, I don't want it anymore. 20 pip break, okay. Now they're just hanging out, right? If I want a continuation set, when support gives, I want to see it burst. It didn't burst here. We just saw buyers take a step back and enter a little bit deeper, enter a little bit deeper. So what I need to be able to get a fill in here is I would need to get price to come back to like a 99.72 with a swing. So like I'd want to see a quick swing high off 99.72 so that I could look at a stop above parity. Okay, that way I could control the risk a little bit more and I could begin basing profit targets off this 99.50, 99.43 zone. Right? That's one way to do it. Alternatively, if I wanted to push this really very aggressively, I can wait to see the way that sellers respond if prices are able to catch some element of resistance below 99.73. So like, for instance, if we go into the US close, price action is dwindling down here, and then we get prices to run back up into this prior little chunky zone of support. If I can see sellers continually offering, 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 protecting this level, then I could look at that for a near-term continuation setup with a target down towards that 99 level. I wouldn't want to get too aggressive for anything below 98.58, however. Kiwi dollar. I still don't have a setup here, but we have RBNZ tomorrow, so I think I might have something before too long. Check this out. Go to the daily chart and look at how aggressive the slope of this recent trend is. Go down a little bit tighter for our chart. You can just you can see how incredibly tight this thing has moved, right? Very little pullback, very little give back. It's basically been a near parabolic like move. Hourly chart. There we go. Now you can see what I'm talking about. This thing's really heating up. Right? Look at all those wicks on the underside of these candles. Lots of buyer support in there. Now, you might not know it, but this is still a downtrend. We're below that 50% marker of that most recent major move, which was quite bearish in nature. And as long as we're below the 7062 area, I'm still going to look at this as being in a downtrend. And probably as long as we're below this swing height around 71. Now, we have RBNZ tomorrow. If I'm going to look for a reversal in the U.S. dollar, this is one of the areas that's most attractive to me right now to do it. Because, one, this move in Kiwi is very much on the back of last week's Fed meeting. right? Notice that bottom was set just a little bit ahead of last week's Fed meeting. But it was as that dollar sell-off was really heating up that this thing really started to pop aggressively. right? Well, if I'm going to look to fade that theme of the dollar sell-off after the Fed rate hike, I'm going to look for the area that's been most responsive to it. And to my eyes, Kiwi's right up there. Now, the way that I want to look for this in a bearish formation, i got a longer term. Uh, longer term is not great. i got a little trend line here to work with. It's kind of a barometer. Go down a little tighter, daily chart. See, I try to get just like the central kind of happy medium point in there. A little bit of support. 
But on the way back up, look at how we resisted off this thing with some some good wick cover, right? When I say good wick cover, when I see something like this, it's it's like evidence to me that we are seeing some type of reaction, right? Because notice how this first wick is long and extended, and the sellers, they just slammed it. This next, next wick did not take out the high of the prior, but again, sellers slammed it. And then this wick, same thing, and sellers slammed it. When I see that, it gives me a good idea that we were seeing some kind of response. It could have been to 70 and a quarter. I don't know. It wasn't 70. 70 is in between all that mess. Uh, but to me, it looks like it's a good good run on the projection of that trend line. Nonetheless, we're at resistance after a recent bullish move. This is not a short for me yet. If I want to start timing the short, if we get a test of 70.20, that opens the door for a test of 70. This is an interesting level to watch as well, but I could kind of reverse engineer this setup because I know where I want my, my peak profit target on short positions to be down here, the 60, 70 area that we were talking about in our last webinar. So that can even allow me to use like a 69.50 area for an entry if I can keep the risk contained with a stop above the 70 big figure, looking for a run revisit of that prior support level. Like I said, we have RBNZ tomorrow. So, you know, if I'm setting this one up tonight, I, I basically need to I need to negotiate a little bit with myself because I'm not going to get the perfect setup here, right? You know, kind of like I was saying a moment ago, I like the idea of this resistance. Don't like the idea of uh, how how bulls have been able to hold it up so aggressively up here. Um, if let's just say that this was tomorrow, RBNZ is a few hours away. I might be willing to accept a setup like that, provided I could get a stop above a figure that I feel pretty decent about. You know, maybe like a 71 and a half area, you know, something like that. There might be, you know, some type of setup there, but if I want to trade it specifically for the rate decision, then I'm probably going to be a little bit more open into a sloppier setup, provided I could still contain the risk. Okay, and our 15th setup of the day, dollar CAD. It's just hanging out in the channel. Well, resisting on the underside of the channel. Um, I don't have anything too exciting here. Now, the way that I'm trying to set this up is I like this as a pure play on the U.S. dollar, but as evidenced by this recent choppiness, we don't have that theme right now, right? And that's one of the reasons that I'm keeping this trend channel on the chart because when I do see price actually come back in, resist, and then support off this channel, that's when I want to start pressing the long stances. We're not there yet. A couple of big levels in the immediate vicinity, 34.62 is a huge one, 33.12 is a big support level, we're at that right now, but to my eyes this is just very sloppy, I need it to resolve itself before I could do anything substantive. 35.75 is a big level for the longer term bullish play. Okay, so the way I don't want to see this develop, as I'd first want to see price action burst back above to get a test here at this 34.62, 34.43 area. Then I'd want to see some support develop around this prior point of resistance, right around the bottom area of this, uh, the trend line making up this channel. After that, I'd want to see a subsequent test, 35.75, at which point I'd expect somewhat of a pause in the uptrend or a little bit of a pullback before we're looking for a deeper run beyond resistance. Like I said, we're just not there yet. We just made a lower low. See where price action is resisting off the lower high. It comes right in at a prior point of support. It's bearish right now. And I don't really have anything that I want to work with on the bearish side of this. Uh, but once it gets bullish, that's when things become interesting again. That's when I want to start looking for some longer term upside in dollar CAD. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. 15 setups on the docket for this week. <clears throat> so uh, Dan had an earlier point here. Uh, I think you have to be bearish on the dollar at this point. Move back to 101 on DXY should be sold. I think that that vantage point is one of the more bullish things going at the moment on it, right? You know, it's it, it's easy to get lost in the shuffle of time frames or, or perspective, you know, and if we look at this on the hourly chart, I mean, it, it, Looks like a going out of business sale, right? Doesn't look like there's anything good there. 
But, you know, we go out to the monthly, it ain't all that bad. Let me get something a little cleaner here. Go out to the monthly, it's, it's really not that bad. We're hanging out near range resistance, right? Right around those 2015 highs. Um, so, yeah, what we're seeing now is it's weird, right? We had a rate hike last week, and then the dollar sold off aggressively. That's very strange. Um, but, you know, I'd be real careful of trying to push this too aggressively to the short side because we know the Fed's listening. And if we see the dollar weakening after a rate hike, they might get a little more aggressive on rate trajectory. I think one of the reasons we are seeing this dollar softness is because the Fed wasn't necessarily hawkish last week when they were hiking rates. They hiked rates, but they kept outlook going out to next year exactly the same, despite the additional quote unquote strength that we've seen within the U.S. economy. And that, you know, as we say in Texas, that dog doesn't hunt. One or the other. If it's stronger, you got to improve guidance. If it's not stronger, then you shouldn't hike rates. One or the other. Uh, Robbie Hill says, I'm very short on stocks, way overstretched. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it's one of those things where thematically it makes a lot of sense. You know, I wrote um, I wrote this piece, I think it was like right about the beginning of the year. And and this, this still holds, uh, it was December 20th, this still holds a lot of weight. This is still very much the case. I think we're even... Uh, I think we're even more overbought right now, but back in December, you know, so this was before the S&P had put in its its most recent terminal move. Terminal move I'm not going to use that word anymore. Is it most recent upside move. Um, the Schiller P/E ratio is, is a simple way of doing an apples to apples comparison amongst American corporates, right? Because it wouldn't be right to compare a technology company versus a bank. It's totally different business models. They're going to trade at totally different multiples, totally different themes and drivers and everything else. But, you know, if we look at this, this is a way of trying to normalize that with what's called 10-year average inflation adjusted earnings. All right? So this is a P ratio on the S&P 500 as a whole using 10-year inflation adjusted average earnings. Notice the value of 30 is, is, is kind of the hot button point here. Okay, we only had one instance before 1990 when we had ever crossed above 30, and that was right ahead of the Great Depression. Now, if you go back to what was happening then, 1929, the Roaring Twenties, people were talking about a new paradigm then as well. Right? It was the post-World War I environment. Everybody was very happy that the world wasn't as war, at, at war any longer. It led to the Roaring Twenties. Have you ever seen the movie The Great Gatsby? Uh, that was the backdrop. Right here in Manhattan, people had the good life. But that came crashing down on Black Tuesday. But when we were in the midst of that new paradigm, we saw stock prices run up in a way that we had never seen before. It fell right back down. Now, after that, that led to the SEC Act of 1933, SEC Act of 1934, Investment Advisor Act of 1940. So there's a lot of regulations that were placed in markets to try to prevent bubbles from ever happening again, right? Well, right here, right here in 1997, we had the repeal of Glass-Steagall, which kind of reopened the doors for banks to go and trade and invest. Now, I'm not going to take a political stance on that. Don't want to get in a political conversation about Glass-Steagall. Frankly, it's not my job to even have an opinion on that. It's my job to trade it. But once Glass-Steagall was repealed, look at the way the stock prices shot to the moon. Schiller P.E. ratio went ballistic after the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Uh, investors valued stocks a lot more after the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Led to the tech bust. It hasn't collapsed. We didn't even get to 30. I think we, last I looked, we were at like 29.04. We've only been at this level of valuation on U.S. stocks a handful of times historically, and it's never turned out well. Each time was an instance of the B word. Uh, if you want to read this article, it's more. Uh, oh, it's you're more than welcome to uh, access it as much or as often or as little as you might like. <laughs> I 
like this, uh, Steve Burke said, Darwinian survival of the fittest in the markets. Absolutely. I mean, evolution is, is applicable to markets in the same way that it is to many other sciences. Um, you know, that's kind of where government comes in, right? Government is supposed to be kind of that arbiter of fairness to prevent the object of game theory playing out, right? Object of game theory is over a long term, you're going to get the same percentages. You know, 1% haves and 99% have nots. 0.1% haves, 99.9% .9 have nots if left unchecked. And the reason it often comes down to motivation and will, because once a competitive advantage is gained, that competitive advantage can then be used to gain even more competitive advantages, right? Think about a billionaire with a personal lobbyist, right? That type of stuff. Um, so yeah, it certainly still plays out for better or worse. <laughs> Pete Miller says, hey bud, you're already in a schizophrenic. I'm okay. Dollar drop, I'm still looking at those same lows for Dollar and his last set in on. Please cover any Ian Crosby for so inclined to cover. My pleasure, my friend. Yeah, it's getting pretty messy out there. I don't, I mean, I think we get BOJ minutes tonight. Um, you know, I'm not too worried about this. If we get a deeper support test, that's okay. The response there is going to be what's really interesting to me, and I'm not going to get worried about anything until we fall below about 110. If we get below 110, all right, then I'm going to have to back off the bullish approach, look elsewhere. But, uh, you know, the puzzling thing to me is that it seems as though both of these central banks Fed and, and BOJ, they want this thing to be going in this, they both want it to be going in the same direction. Right now it's going in the opposite direction. Uh, I know the markets are always right, so I'm not going to just instantly fade that, but I do think over the long term what the central bank here and the central bank here want will end up happening. It's just a question of when. Uh, from Rich Monks, uh, hi, no major news event today, so why the volatility in the S&P? So I've got a theory on this. Um, I didn't want to roll it out the early portion of the webinar because it's uh, it's, it's what you call a working theory. Um, but I think that the, this morning's UK inflation print, I think that kind of jarred something loose with some folks, or at least a few desks, because what happened in the UK is they were looking for a 2.1% annualized inflation print, we got 2.3, which is uh, you know, a hearty beat, well above the 1.8 print from January. You know, and, and I've been talking about this for a while because, again, it's, you know, it's, to me it's just rather mathematical. You get a 20% drop in a currency, importers are going to raise prices. You're going to see inflation. Unless those importers are not concerned about profits, which in maybe in a college textbook, you know, we can look at those examples, but in reality that doesn't exist because markets are Darwinian and the company that's not worried about profits is going to get sold into oblivion, new management, shareholders are going to take over, it's going to be a mess, right? You can't have that uh, archetype academic model of we're going to forego profits in terms of globalization. That doesn't work in the real world, um, at least unless a government agency is, is paying you to make the less uh, profitable option, but even that's not sustainable over the long term. Um, so we had that UK inflation print earlier this morning. I think that was one of the one of the things that kind of shocked folks, saying, "Well, all right, stocks are still elevated, and sure, the Fed wants to hike, but they're going to do it with kit gloves, and you know, kind of taken from the run higher in stock prices that we had in the two days after the rate hike." But now as we get more evidence that they might not be able to take that slow and stodgy approach, we're seeing a little bit of fear come into the fray as the as, as prospect of inflation continues to pick up. That's my take. And then we have, uh, well, we had Esther George speak at noon. We have more Fed speak at 6, uh, Rosengren at 9.45. Um, you know, so there, there's been some, some drive. It's not a ton of data. Uh, for Pete, DXY is an important level, in my opinion. 99.65, 99.53, 99 quarter, uh, and, and below look heavy. Not a head and shoulders guy, but it looks a little Quasimodo-ish. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, 99.23 is huge. That's a February low. Um, 
9965. Yep. Current low. Nine nine fifty three. I can't remember what I had there. Ah, uh, no, no, it's a little deeper. Nine nine forty three. But yeah, we're on the same page, my man. You know, I, I, if I have to guess what's going to happen here, I think we're going to get a, a squeeze low. You know, so I think we might get something that pops down to like a ninety eight ninety two, just to get folks worried enough about the dollar uptrend to, you know, get a little money on the short side. You know, and, and then a reversal, you know, something like that. You know, I only take that because that's kind of what happened in February. Everybody was watching this prior swing low. Everybody was watching this 50 fib. We slid below, but, like, you know, sellers were noticeably absent once we got the slide below support. And then, of course, it led to a pretty strong and bullish month and a half, give or take. But uh, I'm right there with you, my friend. Robbie Hill says, patient this game is worth a million dollars. It's a lot more than that, my man. Ex experience. I think the bigger P word is persistence. I think that that's the biggest uh, kind of theme that I've noticed between successful traders and everybody else is that, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't born with a ton of talents, but persistence is definitely one of them. You know, and so like playing sports, that really helped me out a lot because you know, growing up, you get a lot of coaches that want to put you through the ringer, and you know, I would never quit. I couldn't quit. My dad would never let me. And so, you know, I kind of learned the value of, of losing and the value of failing at a young age because it's going to happen in your life. If you don't expect it to, you're walking through with unrealistic expectations. But, you know, if you can be persistent and you can be patient, and if you keep an open mind, I think that's the third thing. I think you go pretty far in trading because there is no end game, there is no final destination. It's a constant work in process. The Japanese call kaizen, constant improvement. Um, and here is a good question on this point. Uh, Nigel Vaughn asked short term trading, is there any plans to change it? So I get that question a lot. Um, I haven't done a, a webinar with Finger Trap in a few years now. Um, and there's a few different reasons. One is I don't want to be the signal guy. You know, I don't want to be the guy that just gets a bunch of emails. Can I buy your dollar here? Can I sell your dollar here? Because that's not what I, that's not the value I want to bring to anybody. One, I don't know anymore if your dollar is going to go up or down than anybody else. But if I can't actually manage the trade, then it's not going to be my trade, right? I'm not going to give somebody one tenth of the information that they need to go in and set themselves on fire. Um, you know, if I'm going to show a setup, I'm going to show it in the correct way as I see it, as I want to trade it, as I want to work with it. But I think on the side of persistence comes that desire to constantly improve. And I'm still making little small tweaks here and there, and I've been doing this now for 18 years. I don't plan on that ever stopping. That's what I'm so absolutely head over heels in love with this stuff about because I know I'll never be perfect. I know I'll never have a final destination. And I know for the rest of my life, I'm going to be chasing this thing. And it doesn't hurt. So it's it's all gravy to me. It's all great. Um, but, yeah, I'm constantly making little tweaks here and there. And sometimes that tweak is don't trade short-term momentum. You know, Sometimes it's not use the finger trap. Instead, it's to sit back and wait for a swing. There's no final answers. Uh, there's no, you know, objectively always correct answer. And, you know, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying, what it is that I love so much about this stuff is that it is so incredibly subjective, qualitative. And it's so boring to most people that there's a lot of uncharted territory or uncharted ground, right? Um, you're probably well aware that much of Wall Street has went the algorithmic route. So finding a, a manual trader down here on Wall Street anymore is a rarity. There's not many guys like me walking on the street any longer because most of those folks are computer programmers now. Um, but it's really cool when I do meet somebody that, that that does this type of stuff where we could have a conversation on, you know, about something that 99.9% .9 of the world couldn't care less about. And, you know, to me it's, to me it's pretty awesome. Uh, so, yeah, little tweaks here and there. Uh, nothing, nothing wholesale, 
I think the key is just that constant, steady improvement. Always trying to get a little bit better. <laughs> Pete Miller says, every time I see you covering Swiss, I hear saving Private Ryan's line. Don't do it, James. You're a young man. <laughs> Send me your bullets, man. Send me your bullets. Um, you know, I think that's another important aspect of trading, not to get too philosophical here or anything, but, you know, you, you got to kind of look at the long term. As a trader, your job is to take stops. In the same way, it's the job of a salesman to get no's. Now, is a salesman going to make money off no's? Absolutely not, but it does get him closer to his next yes. You're going to take stops in this game, and you are going to lose. It's going to happen. The difference is, I think, in maturity, where a mature trader says, I know I'm going to lose, so I'm going to plan for it, and I'm going to try to mitigate the damage when I'm wrong, try to maximize the benefit when I'm right. I'm going to try to, to improve my analysis as much as I can so that I could be more right than wrong. And then when I am right, I know how to more effectively execute on that. I think that's, you know, that's to me what's, uh, what I really want to try to impart on people. Uh, you know, it's, this isn't a guessing game. This isn't, I'm going to flip a quarter and, you know, buy your dollar or sell your dollar. You could buy your own, I could sell your own, we could both make money. It's all in how it's executed. It's all in how it's done. Um, you know, so I, I don't really have too many hang-ups around pairs or anything like that. Because at the end of the day, these are just a faceless, nameless market to me. You know, I love the themes that go behind it. I love the geopolitical elements that, that drive these things. But don't let any one trade become more than what it is, which is just another line on your blotter. Uh, from Sharif, someone from the Fed was talking around the same time. <laughs> yeah, so this was uh, <laughs> kind of a disaster of what not to do. I don't know if you guys were on Twitter or you caught this earlier today, but Neil Kashkari, the new uh, head of the Minneapolis Fed, decided to do a Twitter Q&A today. Might not have been the greatest time. His uh, The title was Why I Dissented. And I believe he started that Q&A at like 11. Yeah. Timber. Thanks, Neil. Maybe there's a reason that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that no other Fed members on Twitter, especially doing Twitter Q&As. Uh, from Stephen Long Island, I thought maybe the uncertainty over Obamacare repeal replace vote could be weighing on the S&P. It could. Um, you know, but we, we've kind of had that for a while, right? And hasn't really uh, – there's, there's been no delta in that situation to my eyes this morning. Like, it's still a mess, you know, to me. So I had a hard time ascertaining that that was a driver. It could be. It very well could be. From Reno, do you expect gold to top at the same level? That's a good question. Um, that's not it. I don't know, man. It's the wild, wild west over here. You know, when you see these types of sharp moves, it's it's pretty much like the worst type of market for me. Because it doesn't give a whole lot of shake before it turns. You know, it's down and then up. And there's very little room to load up in the early portion of the move. Or the early portion of the move. See where there's like little pullback here? No pullback here. It's pretty much like the worst type of move for me. Can't get much risk concentration. You know, best I got here is, you know, maybe 1250. That was the Briggs at swing low. 1263 up here is pretty interesting. You know, looking for the max pain trade, maybe right here about 1258. You know, so I might do like a three resistance zone type of deal. And, you know, looking for some sellers to come back in. But, you know, as, as long as this thing is, you know, putting these parabolic moves in, I do not want to throw a fade on that. Oh, this is beautiful. Robbie Hill says, persistence is good, but for me, computers deal with that for me. Been 5% or more a month for seven years now. That's beautiful. It's like clockwork level consistency. Um, you know, it, Robbie hit the nail on the head here, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, I, whenever I roll this stuff out, I try to kind of, you know, ask her, hey, this is just the way I do it. It's what works for me. In my experience, that Robbie's answer is the way that the majority of people are more 
amicably able to deal with their own emotions around trading or their own improving their persistence, which is essentially taking a blind-based algorithmic type of approach to it. There's merit in that. There's value in that. And I did not mean to besmirch that earlier when I said most of the street is algo. There's a reason most of the street is algo now, because it works. It removes human emotion, which in most cases doesn't do people much good. Um, you know, so I, I, by no stretch of the imagination, have a, you know, the only way to do things around here. If anything, I'm probably the exception and not the rule anymore. Uh, Shrift asking, do you do any algo-related stuff? Uh, have algos built? I don't have a lot of capital behind them anymore. I did run them quite a bit before January of 2015. After January of 2015, eh, not as exciting. <laughs> All right, I got to take the last two questions of the day. <laughs> All right, so this one's from Steve. Really good observation here. Um, we've had the Brexit situation for a while, too, but every time somebody else breaks it, Sterling takes a hit. So, in my opinion, the reason for that is because of the BOE, right? No, I'm not, you know, like a, a never boe -er to take a common term in today's lingo. Not a never carny-ish. Never, no, that wouldn't work. Whatever. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not against the BOE. I'm not biased against these folks. Um, but, you know, to me, the reason for that pervasive bearishness was because of precisely what happened right here. Right? So, if you remember Brexit, Sterling put in a pretty dramatic drop, and we caught support at about 32 and a half, and then we wiggled back up to 36 and change before we closed the weekend. Now, we had one day of selling to open the new week, and then Sterling was on recovery. And it looked like we were going to come right back to 35 and change or 38, whatever. But you know what happened? Mark Carney called an impromptu press conference to tell everybody, to tell the world, the Bank of England is not taking Brexit lightly. We are going to counter this with dovish accommodation if need be. It's basically saying, I'm going to be a wet blanket for the value of the Sterling. Anytime this thing jumps, I'm going to douse it with more cold water. And that's kind of what happened, right? We get up to resistance, more cold water. Resistance, more cold water. This was actually a corporate bond buying program where the Bank of England decided they wanted to buy 15% of all debt from British Corps. That's just outlandish to me because we, we were just two months after Brexit. Sure, the situation was vulnerable. But we didn't necessarily have that materializing yet. This seems like it would be a hammer that would be great to have in the back pocket for right now so that if Mr. Carney did need to go out and do something more after Article 50 was triggered, now he has something he can do. I digress. Now we got, in, we got the flash crash in October. That's what put this thing in, you know, going back to that term, terminal descent. Now, if you're a company like Apple and you see this, you see a flash crash in a currency, that's when you really can't tolerate stable prices in the UK. That's, that's when you have to respond. Because basically, Apple is in a long position here for their UK operations, right? If the dollar strengthens, well, now Apple's pulling back less in revenue from the UK just because of the exchange rate. Now, in November, and that's what helped to fill in the bullish side of this range in November. That's when we saw the BOE increase their inflation expectations in response to that sharp repricing. And this was kind of like, okay, well, the BOE is not going to be as dovish any longer. But coming back in December, they were dovish again. They said they were very tolerant for inflation overshoots. But this is when, well, this morning, really, is when the rubber really started to hit the road. Uh, last week, we heard a couple of interesting things. We saw one dissenting vote within the Bank of England last week. Uh, that was Kristen Forbes. In the trading forecast for last week, I asked this very important question or very important statement, shift begins to merge within the BOE. And so I think that's what we're seeing. Uh, Stephen Milano says, maybe Carney, Carney likes the likes the pound lower, under the radar currency manipulation. 
I mean, it certainly seems like it. You know, I mean, another saying we have in Texas, it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Is it a frog? Oh, that's a duck, right? So I mean, Carney could say he doesn't want you know, to engage in competitive devaluations, but when you're launching a bazooka of stimulus simply out of the fear for something that may happen, well, that's a different scenario. Uh, but folks, I've went way over my time. I just want to say thank you so much for you uh, to you for your time. Um, if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me on Twitter. I'm more than happy to help with uh, whatever I might be able to. I'm available right there. And uh, if you want to be notified as I send out articles, I am going to send out an email here at some point this week. Um, but you can join my distribution list. Just this real quick little page right there. I'm going to put that link in the chat box. And uh, Whenever I send out an email, I'll try to include a little something that I don't have in articles, a little something unique. Uh, but you'll be on that list, and you'll get it just as soon as everybody else. Uh, but, folks, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.